Um, the finger pointers went away. Like the the pointer just went away for some reason. Oh, others. Oh, so, uh, left. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's backwards from what you naturally think. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I just went away. Oh, there it is. Okay. Mm. Oh, because there's, there's dual monitors now. Oh, so I see. Extended desktop. So oh, okay. If you lose it again, just go left. You, you'll want to go. You'll want to go right because it's over there. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's going to be left. Hmm. It's kind of Oh, okay. I see it. I get it. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, just give me another hour. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Rehearsing this is like 50 minutes. I'm like with stage fright, probably done in like 30 minutes. So. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. All right. Yeah. Your slides are they? They're not up there. Is it? Oh, sorry. Your slides aren't up there. Oh yeah, I still haven't presented it yet, but I'll go ahead and just put the first slide up there. It's Eastern Carolina? Uh, East, East, East Carolina. East Carolina. Is it yeah. East or East Carolina? East. It's just like the tent. Oh, I like East Carolina. I want to be there. Like I know. Me too. I just want to jump dive into there. So do you want to get in the bus there or go home? Sure. I think we'll be done early, but I think it'll be okay. Yeah. I don't know if we're, we're expecting anyone else. I don't know if we're getting any of the nurses and NICU nurses in today. And, uh, <laughs> But I think, sure, go ahead. <coughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds. For the CME credit, there is an evaluation form. And then remember, there's the number you need to call and then the zip code you need to put in when you dial that number. So everyone, please go ahead and sign in. And then presenting for us for Grand Rounds is Dr. Abulaziza. He did his medical training at the University of Technology, and he has been here as a Fiesta president for the last three years. While he's been here as a Fiesta president, he's been involved in several um, research projects, dealing with neonatal abstinence. He's developed an app for smartphones with our neonatology manual. Um, he is planning to do a neonatology fellowship starting in July at Eastern Carolina. And the topic of his talk this afternoon is neonatal resuscitation if you could be that good on <laughs> So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Tool. All right, can you guys hear me in the back over there? All right, good, we're good, awesome, okay. Um, so my talk, um, neonatal resuscitation, um, I'll be going over briefly the steps for neonatal resuscitation, but my focus primarily be on uh, the updates that were done in 2015 um, in the new seventh edition NRP guidelines. Um, so we'll talk uh, more focus on uh, the, the, th the things that they brought up uh, last year. Disclosure, I have nothing to disclose. Again, objectives. Um, we'll go over the steps for neonatal station, and again, we'll focus more on the 2015 RP guidelines. So I made a little lecture guide. Um, so just kind of tell you guys what we're gonna be going over today. Um, the first set of slides, I'll be talking about getting ready to resuscitate, um, being well prepared, um, your equipment check, um, assessing the risk, um, and knowing which is a high risk, what's a, uh, a high risk baby that will be in the resuscitation. Uh, we'll go over the, the algorithm, and um, so that's now 15, they made a newer algorithm that, we'll, that I'll show you. Um, again, we'll, topics that I'll talk about would be the delayed core clamping versus milking. There are some talks about that. Um, and then we'll go on to the initial steps of your resuscitation, um, and we'll focus more on maintaining the temperature, assessing the heart rate, and uh, what they spoke about with use of EKGs, clearing the airway, coniform aspiration. We'll also talk about assessing and providing options to the term and preterm infants. Um, we'll talk about PPV, PEEP, uh, CPAP, chest compression, medication, post resuscitation care. Um, and we'll end with withholding and discontinued care along with the briefing and the briefing. So 
getting ready to resuscitate, the most important step for resuscitation is being ready. Uh, the more prepared you are, uh, the more everything will go smoothly and easily during your resuscitation. Personnel trained in neonatal resuscitation should be readily available to perform neonatal resuscitation whether um, problems aren't sustained or not. At least one healthcare provider should be assigned the primary role and uh, that provider should uh, would be initiating the resuscitation procedures and intubation and chest compressions. In the presence of significant perineal risk factors um, for the need of resuscitation, more additional personnel with resuscitation skills should be immediately available. All trained personnel who are immediately available should have the requisite knowledge and skills to carry out a complete needle cessation. That includes intubations, uh, administering medications. Uh, the equipment needed for cessation should be available in every delivery area. And equipment uh, needs to be routinely checked to ensure they are functioning properly. And if you're in the delivery room with Dr. DeVoe, he'd probably make sure that you went through your equipment check before you're assisting the babies. Readiness for needle cessation requires um, one assessment of perinatal, uh, perinatal risk, uh, a system to assemble the appropriate personnel based on that risk, an organized method for uh, ensuring immediate access to supplies and equipment, and standardization of behavioral skills to that help assure effective teamwork and communication. When the perinatal risk factors are identified, a team should be mobilized and team leaders should be identified. And if you have time, the leader should conduct a uh, pre resuscitation briefing, which would include um, identifying the interventions that may be required and assigning roles to each of the uh, personnel. Um, again, it's vital uh, during resuscitation that teamwork demonstrates effective communication and teamwork skills to help ensure quality and patient safety. Um, so you see this screaming in a red speaker loud or putting your hands in your ears, that's not considered effective communication. Equipment that you'll be using, so you have your suction equipment, um, that's including your bulb suction, um, mechanical suction, tubing catheters, um, your meconium aspirator. Intubation equipment, uh, you have your laryngoscope uh, with blade sizes, um, face masks, oxygen source of flow meter. Medical students, those are not, that's not a real laryngoscope, so don't go <laughs> look for your Heineken bottle. <laughs> Medication equipment, so your normal saline, epinephrine, or um, ones you'll be using most, needles, syringes, your umbilical vessel catheterization kit, and um, other things that might not be in the kit, like your straw gloves, uh, antiseptic prep solution, uh, your catheter, three-way, stopcock, make sure they're all available. Other equipment would be your, your warmer, warm towels, um, pull socks, or differential airways, oxygen blender, plastic wrap, transporter, incubator. So you want to assess um, what babies are high risk. Um, the way I kind of divide it would be into two things. For delivery, maternal causes, you have your fetal causes and uh, risks that you'll find during delivery. Starting with the maternal causes, Mothers above um, 40 years or less than 16 years of age uh, more at risk for preterm uh, deliveries or um, genetic problems. Socioeconomic status like poverty, malnutrition might give you an idea of how well they're keeping up with their OB visits. Their detrimental habits like smoking, drugs, and alcohol abuse all really important. Continuing on maternal uh, medical conditions. Um, uh, mother diabetics, so infant diabetic mothers are, uh, of course, a high risk. Um, hypertension, mom could develop uh, preeclampsia or eclampsia, chronic heart, lung, or kidney disease, either direct effect from these illnesses on the baby or uh, indirectly from chronic use of medications that mom could be on. Blood disorders like thrombocytopenia and anemia. History of previous stillbirth and early needle death might give you a hint. Um, Antipartum hemorrhage, uh, premature rupture of membranes could give you a risk for infections, and UTIs, GPS carrier mothers. Uh, placental anomalies like uh, placental brevia, polyoligohydramnios. Fetal condition, you have your pre and post maturity, uh, IUGR, macrosomia, congenital anomalies. like high drops um, and abnormalities of presentation, transverse line, breach. There's an ultrasound uh, there that shows um, ascites like, uh, that could be diagnosed, because yeah. 
prolapsed cord during the birth, uroplacental bleeding, foul smell, meconium stain, um, not fluid. And I just wanted to show you that's all, that's an ultrasound. Sometimes they're able to pick up like meconium by ultrasound, but it's really difficult and hard to see. Abnormal fetal heart patterns if the baby's having any late D cells or instrumental delivery for of vacuum cesarean. And prematurity, of course, it's considered a high risk. Preterm babies are more likely to develop, uh, to, to require resuscitation, develop complications, um, particularly those that uh, weigh less than one kilogram. And that's for, um, because number one, they, they're more prone to hypothermia um, due to their large body surface area to mass, their thin skin and decreased uh, subcutaneous fat. Um, the smaller the infant, the more difficult it is to prevent hypothermia. Also, premature infants um, have inadequate ventilation because of their immature lungs. Um, they may be deficient in surfactant and difficult to inflate and ventilate. Immature respiratory drive and weak respiratory muscles, which could lead to chance of happening apnea. Um, the risk for infection, maternal infection associated with premature delivery and offspring of affected mothers are at risk for antenatal infections. Um, Premature babies have immature immune systems, which would be hard for them to fight off infections and increasing their risk for acquiring postnatal infection. Organ damage um, could be due to immature tissues and capillaries um, that are more vulnerable to injury uh, resulting in complications. For example, your capillaries in the retina could lead you to retinopathy, prematurity, uh, and injury to the capillaries in the germinal matrix could lead to intracranial hemorrhage. Um, premature infants have immature antioxidant defense um, uh, mechanism, um, which will give them, they will be unable to counter out the effects of free radicals. Um, this may contribute to many of the morbidities of prematurity like BPD and neck. Going on, so next we'll talk about the algorithm that the NRP has set place. You guys all remember the 2010 card that's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, that's the uh, updated version, the late 2015, and they'll include that in the seventh edition of the NRP this year. So make sure you carry a card. So going over the algorithm, um, so you did your antenatal counseling and team briefing and equipment check, um, and the baby then is born. Um, of course, you want to know, is it term gestation? Is there a good tone? Is the baby breathing or crying? And if yes, you'd go on to your, um, your, your routine care, um, placing baby with mom, uh, skin to skin. Uh, now the baby is not, um, you'd warm the baby, um, maintain normal temperature, position airway, clear secretions, and uh, stimulate. Um, and if the baby is gasping um, or heart rate below 100, um, you would go straight to PP, uh, PPV, uh, positive pressure ventilation, uh, placed on an oxygen monitor and considered e uh, ECG monitor. Um, the considering ECG monitor, that's something that they, um, that they added. Um, again, this is all, if you um, look, it's all within one minute. Um, so it's really, really important to assess these babies and if uh, they're not getting ventilated correctly, that could be your problem. Um, and if they're not, um, uh, they're not apneic or not gasping, um, you'd go to positioning the airway, um, uh, clearing the airway, uh, giving supplement oxygen considering CPAP. Now, if the baby is continuing to gasp and your heart rate is um, still below 100, is below 100, um, you'd check the chest movement, um, ventilation correcting steps if needed, um, ET tube, laryngeal mask if needed. And that's just trying to enforce the importance of making sure you have good ventilation um, uh, with a low heart rate. And if, um, and if the answer is no, and your heart rate's below 60, um, again, it's reminding you one more time before going to the chest compressions um, to intubate if you haven't already done so. Um, and, um, and then again, if, if you are intubating, you have a good airway, uh, you go to chest compressions, um, uh, coordinate with a PPV, giving 100% oxygen, um, considered UVC placement. And if the heart rate is still below, you would um, go to your medications, giving IV epinephrine, and also think about other causes. So you need to rule out uh, pneumothorax uh, and consider hypovolemia. Um, always keep a lookout for other things like congenital diaphragmatohernia. So always make sure you get your uh, x-rays and look out for other causes. 
Oh yeah, so the next topic we're going to talk about would be um, the delayed cord clamping and milking. Um, in 2010, um, the NRP guidelines, they said there was increasing evidence of benefit for delayed cord, cord clamping for at least one minute in term and preterm infants uh, not requiring resuscitation, um, but insufficient evidence for the infants requiring resuscitation. Um, later on, there's been uh, national recommendations for delayed cord clamping to be practiced when possible only for infants not requiring resuscitation. Um, the first article on the left is from the Journal of uh, Pediatrics in 2013, and the one on the right is um, 2012, um, the American College of Statisticians and Gynecologists uh, com uh, Committee Opinion also agreed on the same thing. Of course, there's no evidence regarding safety utility for infants requiring resuscitation. So I guess if your baby is requiring resuscitation, the last thing you would worry about is um, delaying the cord clamping, which, which makes sense. 2015 updates, um, they said delayed cord clamping after 30 seconds, so they lowered it from a minute to 30 seconds, is suggested for both term and preterm infants who do not require association at, at birth. Um, delayed cord clamping, they said it was associated with less um, intraventricular hemorrhage, um, higher blood pressure and blood volume, um, less need for transfusion after birth, and less necrotizing enterocolitis. The only adverse consequence in the found uh, was slightly increase in level of bilirubin, which would li lead to more phototherapy. Next topic about cord milking. Um, there's two articles, um, one on the left titled Umbilical Cord Milking, Reducing the Need uh, for Red Cell Transfusion and Improves Neonatal Adaption in Infants Born Less Than 29 Weeks of Gestation, a Randomized Controlled Trial. That was in 2008, um, and they studied um, 40 babies, um, the ages were 24 to 28 weeks gestation um, in Tokyo, Japan. Um, they said that, uh, they, they suggested that milking might have the same results um, as the late core clamping. Um, and the other, the other article, that was in 2013, um, from the journal of Perinatology by March, um, enrolled 75 uh, patients in Boston. They said babies milked would have higher um, hematocrit and less need for blood transfusion also decreased incidence of ventricular hemorrhage. Um, but no recommendations were made for its routine use as there is insufficient evidence for its safety or utility. And the way they do the milking, if anyone um, doesn't know, is um, they would take their index finger and their thumb and just basically just push everything through the cord and just an arm width That's what they do. Again, no recommendations were made for that. Okay, next we're going on on the initial steps for cessation. So the nurse hands you the baby, what are you gonna do? Um, make sure the baby, uh, you're maintaining normal temperature for the infant. Um, you're positioning the infant for uh, good airway, clearing the secretions if needed. Um, drying the infant, stimulating the baby to breathe. Taking one thing at a time, we'll talk about maintaining the temperature. It's been, uh, We've known since 1907, um, and this is an article um, in Buting, Pierre Buting's publication in The Nursling, um, and they're discussing about the importance of maintaining the temperature in newborns, and they said it's a strong predictor of, of mortality at all gestational ages. The hypothermia is associated with um, serious uh, morbidities, um, such as IVH, hypoglycemia, late onset sepsis. So your goal of maintaining temperature, uh, you want to minimize the heat loss, um, and ways you could do that is placing a warm uh, towel or blanket, uh, placing the baby under the pre-warm radiant warmer, um, and the radiant warmer is temperature control. The warmer should be regulated by the server control, uh, the probe, which is monitored by temperature uh, skin probe placed on the infant's abdomen. Um, it's really important that everyone knows how that works and how to place the probe and where not to place the probe. So where you do not want to place your probe would be on bony promises, areas of uh, brown fat deposits, and that's uh, on the neck, mediastinum, uh, scapular areas, axillary areas, near kidneys and adrenals. And that's the picture telling you where the, the brown fat deposits are. And well, basically what brown, deposit, uh, what brown fat deposits are is um, areas where there's fast and high metabolism of adipose tissue. Um, 
So those areas um, could be warmer than the rest of the body and give you like a false information. So if you put your probe on those areas, it could be sending the wrong information to the radiant warmer, which will lead to cooling the baby and the baby being um, cold. Uh, don't place your probe on poorly vascularized areas, excreted uh, areas, and keep the probe exposed to the heat source and make sure the probe is attached securely. And depending on the condition, now infants that do not require resuscitation, you don't want to, you want to swaddle the infant um, after drying and skin to skin with moms. And you can see those two pictures to tell you that even dads could work. Um, infants, like if moms are having cesarean sections or, um, and so usually I've seen them in the newborn nursery, the, um, they tuck the baby in the shirt of the dad, but those dad went extreme and they're completely naked. I don't know. All right, um, infants with birth weights less than one and a half uh, kilograms, you, you can use polyurethane bags or wraps, raise the, temp the rim temperature to 26 degrees Celsius, and use warming pads. Um, infants who require respiratory support, uh, you can use humidified and heated air. All resuscitation procedures, including um, endotracheal intubation, chest compression, and certain lines, can be performed using the temperature control intervention in place, like the warming pads I've discussed. Um, <clears throat> temperature of newly born non asphyxiated infants uh, should be maintained between 3.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius after birth through uh, admission and stabilization. That's roughly 97.7 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there's an article in 2004 um, in the pre hospital emergency care journal um, titled Effective Ventilation and Temperature Control Are Vital to Outborn Resuscitation. Um, and um, this is a retrospective chart review study. Uh, they, took, um, they compared outborn and inborn uh, infants, I think 35 babies in each. They noticed that there was higher mortality rates in the babies that were hypothermic. Warming the cold babies. Um, so previous recommendations, um, they were saying that uh, neonates who are hypothermic after resuscitation, um, uh, they recommended that slower Rewarming is preferable to faster rewarming to avoid apnea and arrhythmias. Um, there's insufficient data to support that. Um, either rapid warming 0.5 degrees Celsius per hour uh, greater versus slow rewarming less than 0.5 degrees Celsius per hour um, really didn't make any change. And that was in the 2015 updates. They said either approach is it's, uh, reasonable. Uh, maintaining temperature in resource limited areas. Um, uh, in the updates, they mentioned uh, to maintain uh, temperature during transition from birth until one to two hours of life. And while newborns, it may be reasonable to put them in a clean food grade plastic bag uh, up to the level of the neck, swaddle them after drawing, uh, nurse with skin to skin contact. And that's a picture of a 22 weeker, uh, five, about 560 grams, who kept alive in a Ziploc bag. Um, next step, we are uh, so you maintain temperature. You're assessing the heart rate. Um, the auscultation of precardium and the use of pulse augs have been routinely used in heart rate uh, to assess heart rate in delivery room. And that was in the ten, uh, ten guidelines that said if you want to assess heart rate, you could um, assess um, by auscultating the precardial pulse. And if you can't detect the pulse, you could use palpation of the umbilical uh, uh, pulse to. Pr uh, that to provide a rapid estimate of the pulse. A pulse loss can, be, uh, can provide continuous assessment of the pulse without interruption of other recession measures. Um, but as far as the use of EKGs uh, was not mentioned in 2010. And why they're considering it now in the uh, new updates is that EKGs have been found to display an accurate heart rate faster than pulse ox. Um, pulse ox may display a lower rate in the first two minutes of life. Pulse ox may, may not function during states where poor cardiac output or perfusion, um, like consistent cardiac failure. And underestimation of the heart rate may lead to unnecessary resuscitation. So three articles. Um, first one um, titled Actually of Clinical Assessment of Heart Rate um, in Delivery Room, that was in 2006 in the Journal of Resuscitation. Um, 
in Australia, they compared the methods of uh, assessing the heart rate and they found it to be um, inaccurate and unreliable as far as auscultation and palpation, palpating the umbilical cord. Um, the other article, um, in, uh, Drone Pediatric 2012, um, that they said that the ECG were faster to, um, um, to pick up with the heart rate versus the pulse ox, and that was 20 seconds versus 36 seconds. Um, <clears throat> And the last article um, is also it's out 13 is also in Australia. Um, they said that pulse ox accuracy was poor in low SATs, and that's specifically in SATs below 70%. Um, and uh, and the new guidelines suggest that the use of ECGs may be a reasonable option to provide rapid, accurate estimation of you know, a neonatal heart rate in the delivery room. So now the question comes up: What's What's the beef with using EKGs in the delivery room? Um, so EKGs does not replace the need for a pulse ox. You'll still need a pulse ox to know the, uh, the uh, oxygen stats of your baby. Um, and with the extra time, so the, it could, the EKGs could pick up the heart rate much faster, but would placing the leads be longer than just putting that pulse ox on, on the hand? Um, is information needed uh, will be more beneficial or not? Uh, would the leads uh, enter the fragile skin in your premature babies? So those are stuff things you want to think about, but there still need more um, more uh, um, studies to go on that. Um, next up, clearing the airway. So you want to make sure you're positioning the baby in the right position. Um, you don't want it to have, be in the flex, uh, flexion position or hyperextension position. Um, you want to make sure there's good alignment with the posterior larynx, uh, the, uh, the pharynx, larynx, and trachea. In the 1010 guidelines, um, they say suctioning immediately after birth is for babies with obvious obstructions, uh, just secretions, babies who require positive pressure ventilation. Um, and then, of course, when you're suctioning, you suction the mouth before the nose. Uh, easier way to remember that is the letter M comes before the letter N. Suctioning should be avoided if it's not indicated. Um, so the baby's crying, breathing well, your stats are good. Don't routinely go in with a bulb suction. And why is that? Because you might induce um, apnea or bradycardia. Um, there's an article with um, oropharyngeal uh, suction versus no suction in normal term infants delivered by elective cesarean section. That was in 2005. Um, um, it, was take, it was a uh, prospective randomized controlled trial taken in Ankara, Turkey. Um, they randomized controlled 140 babies. Uh, they found that uh, the baby with the no suction group reached higher oxygen sats uh, quicker than the suction groups. Um, in older studies, um, the one on the left, the oral, um, uh, the oral nasal pharyngeal suctioning at birth effects on atrial oxygen saturations. That was in 1997. Um, they studied 30 babies in Uruguay. Um, they said that even for like intubated baby, uh, intubated infants, uh, tracheal suction could cause pulmonary uh, compliance and um, a problem with oxygenation. Um, and the other article, 1982, um, they uh, that was in Washington University. They studied 35 uh, preterm infants, and the, um, the article title is "Suctioning uh, Suctioning in Preterm Infants Effect on Cerebral." blood flow velocity, intracranial pressure, and arterial blood pressure. Um, they found that that could increase the cerebral blood flow velocity and increasing the risk for IVH. Um, and the way they measured it is they just put a, a Doppler on the uh, baby's anterior fontanelle and, um, and measured while they're doing suctioning. That's how they got their data. Another talk they, uh, they mentioned in the seventh edition uh, NRP last year was is wiping the mouth and nose uh, just as effective as suctioning. Um, and the only article that I found was in 2011, um, and this was done in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, it's a randomized, not masked, um, equivalency trial conducted in a single center. Uh, babies were, uh, they measured were 488. They, they're assuming wiping the face, mouth, and nose with a towel was equivalent to suctioning the, mou the mouth and nose with a bulb suction. Um, after delivery uh, for babies more than 35 weeks of station, their, their primary outcome was um, like the mean respiratory rate in the first 24 hours. Of course, non-vigorous babies uh, or kind of saying, uh, babies or babies with major malformations were excluded. Um, they found that there's no significant uh, differences in the APGAR scores or secondary outcomes, which are babies that end up, end up 
winding, needing intubation or PPV or admission to the NICU. Um, there was a lot of deviations. There was 117 of the 488 cases. That was 24% of them. Um, babies that were assigned to the wiping who ended up receiving suctioning anyways. So uh, further investigations are needed to compare wiping versus suctioning. Next fun talk in 2015 was uh, <coughs> the using mechanism aspiration. Um, and if the baby is born through mucotinium stain, amniotic fluid, the 2015 guidelines um, um, say that you want to start with your initial steps. And this is, again, non-vigorous uh, babies with formal stone, inadequate breath efforts. You want to do your initial steps, you want to, which is a warming, maintaining temperature, positioning the infant, clearing the airway, and drying and stimulating the infant. <clears throat> um, they said PPV uh, should be initiated if the infant is not breathing or the heart rate is less than 100 uh, beats per minute after initial steps are completed. Routine intubation and tracheal suctioning of this uh, setting is not suggested. And the reason for that, they said there's the evidence for resuscitation, uh, the evidence suggested that resuscitation should follow the same principles for infants and mycodium stained fluid as for those with clear fluid. I mean, so they're, they're just pushing on to continuing just your regular resuscitation steps. Um, again, um, uh, this, what we used to do before was we would just go in and intubate uh, uh, and do your um, mycodium aspiration, um, whether you give the baby a chance or not to breathe. So why they routinely do not want to ask, uh, intubate and aspirate is because they're trying to avoid the potential harm. And that could be harm from delaying uh, providing uh, bag mass ventilation. So previously what we do, you won't give oxygen. You just go into intubate. And getting ready to intubate, get, uh, setting up the baby, that's all causing a delay for giving oxygen. Um, and the procedure itself, uh, the harm from the future itself. And also because there's insufficient evidence to continue recommending this practice, that's why they're, they're not recommending it. This is a video I want to share with you guys. Um, not necessarily to learn from the procedure or how it's done. This was um, a video um, that I got from a doctor named Jose Enrique Mora um, from Pernambuco University in Recife, Brazil. Um, and, uh, and he said, and he said that he, uh, I want you guys to focus also on how, how he intubates this baby. And we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> but I just wanted to show you guys what a meconium stained non vigorous baby looks like. Let's see if the sound. And now he's adding some pressure ventilation. So when I was looking for videos on codium aspiration, I saw that, and I just wanted to show that to you guys, because I was, because I had a question mark on how he was intubating that baby, and he told me this is something called digital intubation. I think maybe the ER folks would know a little better. Basically what you do is you just feel for the tongue, go back to uh, pass the blottis, and go to your airway, and just uh, guide your intratracheal tube uh, to the airway. Um, don't try this at home. I don't think anyone ever tried it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially if you have a big finger. Yeah. If you're in Brazil, you could try it, but let's not try that here in the United States. <laughs> Just that Portuguese. He, um, he had a whole article. <laughs> he, had, he had a whole article written out on how he does this in, uh, in babies, um, but it was all in Portuguese. I didn't understand it. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, and uh, he said he did a workshop in um, one of the previous uh, PAS conferences in Washington, D.C. Um, on doing digital intubation uh, new needs. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. In, in Brazil, they pretty, go pretty hardcore. So, I, I <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Definitely. Oh, he's talking about the pneumothorax. Yeah. If you don't have the pop-up valve, then basically the pop-up valve limits how much, how much he gets with our friends. You guys want to see it again? <laughs> okay. Moving on. So um, next we'll talk about assessing and providing oxygen. Uh, so when you're assessing oxygen need, uh, we all have this in our NRP cards. Um, it tells you um, each minute after birth and what your uh, goal for oxygen stats are. Um, blood oxygen levels generally uh, do not reach extratrine levels until approximately 10 minutes after following birth. Always important to keep that in mind. Um, oxygen stats may remain the 70 to 80 percent range for several minutes following birth. Both insufficient and excessive oxygen station can be harmful for the infants. When you're putting your uh, pulse ox probe, it should be placed on preductal location on the right uh, upper extremity, usually the wrist or medial surface of the palm. Um, and always uh, and keep in mind that 100 percent stats is not really a, a good sign because. Um, your um, pulse ox kind of only measured with the uh, infrared light, and the red light the, gives you a kind of estimate measure of the hemoglobin that's been ox oxygenated. So you might give more oxygen, oxygen that could be dissolved in the plasma blood um, that wouldn't be picked up. So it's 100% not good. As far as giving oxygen to term infants, um, these were two main analysis uh, of several randomized controlled trials comparing neonatal resuscitation with room air versus 100% oxygen. And they showed increased survival when resuscitation was initiated with, initiated with air. Um, uh, the first one was in 2006, and that was in Canada. They used the Cochrane Central Registry controlled trials. And the second one was in 2004 in Australia, and they included about 1,302 babies in their study. Um, so there hasn't been, with that, there hasn't been any change in the 2010 guidelines. Again, this is offering oxygen to term infants um, to initiate your resuscitation at 21%. Um, and you could titrate your oxygen uh, concentration to achieve oxygen uh, uh, saturation in the target range. Um, and of course, you may give oxygen to a baby if he's uh, bradycardic, he or she bradycardic. There's been seven randomized uh, uh, meta-analysis uh, meta-analysis of seven randomized studies. Um, and those studies, they said initiating resuscitation of preterm newborns, uh, less than 35 weeks of gestation with high oxygen, uh, more than 65%, and low oxygen, uh, their range was 21 to 30%, showed no improvement in the survival uh, to hospital discharge with the use of high oxygen. Um, and there's no benefit was seen in the prevention of BPD, IVH, or retinopathy of prematurity. So when oxygen, uh, when oxygen targeting was used as a co-intervention, the oxygen concentration of the resuscitation gas and preductal uh, oxygen saturation were similar between the high oxygen group and the low oxygen groups within the first 10 minutes of life. Um, so in all studies, irrespective to whether air uh, of ox uh, high oxygen, which includes also up to 100%, um, in an issue of cessation, most infants were approximately 30% by the time of stabilization. So kind of in summary, resuscitation of preterm newborn should be initiated with low oxygen, that's your 21 to 30 percent, and the oxygen concentration should be uh, titered to achieve preductal oxygen saturation approximately to the intraquartal range, which is the chart that we showed earlier. Um, initiating resuscitation of premature infants uh, with uh, high oxygen is not recommended. Next up, we'll talk about PPV, PEEP, and CPAP. 
Um, so <coughs> uh, initial inflation pressure is 20 centimeters H2O may be effective, um, but more than 30 to 40 may be required in term babies without spontaneous ventilation. Um, there's insufficient evidence to recommend the op uh, in a certain optimum infl inflation time. Quick improvement of heart rate, of course, is your primary measure of, of adequate initial ventilation. Um, other ways you want to assess is a, a chest wall movement uh, if the heart rate doesn't improve initially. Um, assessed ventilation should be delivered at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute to achieve maintain heart rate more than 100 per minute. There have been talk about sustaining uh, inflation, uh, like uh, effects of sustained inflation duration. Um, in the first article on the left, um, uh, they were that was done in 2012 in Australia. They looked at 18 lambs, um, and they induced asphyxia um, by like occluding their umbilical cord and delaying ventilations up to like 10 minutes after birth. Uh, they divided the lambs into three groups. Um, the first group, uh, they started inflation times of 0.5 seconds and ventilation rate of 60 per minute. The second group was they gave them five sets of three second inflations. Uh, and the third group was they gave them a single 30 second inflation. Um, and they found that the shortest uh, time for the babies to reach a good heart rate of more than 120 was in the, the lambs that got the single 30 second inflation group and when they're starting uh, um, ventilation. The other study um, <coughs> um, titled The Effects of Sustained Inflation of Length of Establishing, establishing Functional Residual Capacity at Birth in Ventilated Premature Rabbits. Um, they did that in premature rabbits. Um, so um, fact of the day, um, a normal pregnancy for rabbits is 31 days. Uh, and premature the rabbits that they did in the study was 28 days. So really premature. <laughs> Um, they're, um, so they, they measured uh, the lung aeration using like x-rays, serial x-rays, um, and the conclusion was that increasing the duration of initial inflation uh, to 10 or 20 seconds increased the gas volume entering the lung. Um, so this theory is kind of like pushing out all the fluid out of the lung quickly. Um, so again, these animal studies say it may be beneficial for establishing functional uh, residual capacity during transition from fluid-filled to air-filled lungs after birth. Um, in 2015, uh, the review of literature they included three randomized controlled trials and two cohort studies, uh, which showed a benefit sustained inflation for reducing need for mechanical ventilation, um, no benefit in re reduction of mortality, BPD, or air leak. Um, again, there's low quality in the evidence, uh, uh, was downgraded for variability in interventions. Um, and with that insufficient data to support uh, routine application and sustained inflation of greater than five seconds duration to transitioning newborn. So don't do it. Um, in expiratory pressure, uh, uh, there's a study uh, um, uh, titled Comparison Devices for Newborn Ventilation in the Delivery Room. Um, this was in 2014. Um, and it's a low quality evidence because initially this uh, study was um, to compare the effectiveness of safety and safety of the T-piece resuscitator compared to the self-inflating uh, uh, bag in achieving heart rate more than 100 beat per minute at two minutes in newborns more than 26 weeks gestation. Um, but so in the 2015 guidelines, what they pretty much did is just for repeat what, the 20, in what they said in 2010. Um, which is use a peep of about five centimeters HCO peep um, when administering uh, PPV to preterm newborns. And this will require editing a peep valve for self cleaning bags. Updates on the laryngeal masks. Um, so, using laryngeal masks, um, uh, you could uh, achieve effective ventilation in term preterm newborns more than 34 weeks gestation. Um, there's limited data on their use for babies less than 34 weeks of gestation or weigh less than two kilograms. Um, they're recommended when uh, into, in, uh, tracheal intubation is unsuccessful or not feasible. Um, its use has been not evaluated as far as giving medications um, or um, using them during chest compressions. There hasn't been any uh, uh, data to support how they're effective in that. That's a baby that has a congenital epilis, um, which is like a gingival granule cell tumor. So that that kind of be hard for you to intubate. So this slipping in a laryngeal mask might be an easier way. <coughs> uh, 
Um, and going on to intracranial intubation, uh, indicated when uh, bag mass ventilation is effective or prolonged for special for special circumstances like um, CEDH. Um, your CO2 defect, uh, detectors are effective even in uh, low birth weight infants. Keep that in mind. Um, and also, if your CO2 is not detecting, um, that means you probably have um, a couple problems. Either you're in the wrong tunnel, you're intubating the esophagus, or there's poor absent pulmonary blood flow initially, like in cardiac arrest. Additional uh, indications um, for correct tube placement, um, it looks, you could find chest movement, presence of equal breast sounds bilaterally, and condensation in the endotracheal tube. Next, we'll talk about CPAP. Um, these are three randomized controlled trials uh, enrolling total of 2,358 preterm infants born less than 30 weeks gestation. Uh, demonstrated that starting newborns on CPAP may be beneficial when compared to endotracheal intubation and PPV. Um, the first top one, um, the first two are top ones are from the New uh, England Journal of Medicine and the bottom ones from the Journal of Pediatrics. Um, first one was in 2008. Uh, they were, um, uh, they enrolled in their study babies that were born 25 to 28 weeks gestation. Um, they found that even though the CPAP group had more incidence of pneumothorax, fewer infants received oxygen at uh, 28 days of life, and they had fewer days of ventilation. Um, the second one titled Early CPAP for Surfactant in Extremely Preterm Infants, that was 2010. Um, they considered CPAP as an alternative to intubation and surfactant in preterm uh, infants. Um, and last uh, one, that was in 2011, um, and what they, and their way, their way of study was that they compared three groups, uh, patients that were intubated and stayed on the vent and received surfactant versus intubated surfactant, then extubated versus babies that was on CPAP, and they had uh, similar results, uh, which is decrease in rate of intubation, decrease in duration of mechanical ventilation, whether no significant increase in air leak or severe IVH. So based on the evidence in the 2015 guidelines, um, it says spontaneous breathing preterm infants with respiratory distress may, uh, may be supported with CPAP initially rather than routine intubation for administering PPV. Moving on to chest compressions. So chest compression is indicated if the heart rate is less than 30 beats per minute. And that's, of course, despite adequate ventilation, made it bold, put a line under it. <laughs> saying it again. Uh, so make sure you're delivering adequate ventilation before you jump to uh, chest compressions. And I put in that chart for Mr. Sopa, you guys probably remember from the NRP, um, uh, from NRP book, um, which is a mask adjustment, repositioning the airway, suctioning mouth and nose, open mouth, pressure increase and in airway uh, alternative. Um, Chest compressions, uh, this is a quick review, chest compressions are delivered at lower third of the sternum at a depth of approximately one third of the anterior posterior diameter of the chest. Um, the two thumb technique is preferred over the two finger technique uh, and for that because it generates higher blood pressures and coronary perfusions and less fatigue for the rescuer who's providing chest compressions. Always keep your thumb on the chest even during relaxation allowing the chest to uh, re-expand fully. Um, the ratio you go three, one compressions to ventilation, that's about 30 uh, compressions and 30 breaths in one minute. You may use higher ratios, 15 to two, if the rest is believed to be cardiac or, uh, of cardiac origin and avoid frequent interruptions. And um, don't use just one single feedback device like an uh, entitled CO2 monitor or just a pulse ox for detecting return of spontaneous circulation in the asystolic uh, bradycardic neonates. Um, the needle guidelines, writing group, they support increasing the oxygen concentration to 100% whenever chest compressors are provided. Um, there's lack of studies regarding its use in the new natal CPR. Uh, they base theirs on the on adults. And there's also animal evidence shows no advantage to 100% uh, oxygen during CPR. But as the heart rate recovers, the supplement oxygen should be weaned. Um, as far as medications, um, 2010 dosing uh, remained unchanged. Main medication you'll be using is epinephrine. Um, that's a dose 0.01 to 0.03 milligrams per keg, and that's the 1 to 10,000 uh, uh, units of epinephrine, uh, epinephrine concentration. Um, 
Again, you, you want to go with IV is more preferred than going through the endotracheal uh, route. And if you want to give endotracheal administration, you go with the higher doses of 0.05 to 0.1 milligrams per cake. Volume expansion, um, you know, you're, if you're suspecting blood loss, things to look out that would give you clues for blood loss would be pale skin, poor perfusion, weak pulse, um, and heart rate not responding adequately to other assistive measures. Um, use our isotonic crystalloid or blood um, for volume expansion, recommended doses uh, 10 ml per kg. And rapid infusions of large, uh, uh, rapid infusions of large volumes have been associated with IVH. Keep that in mind. Uh, post, resuscita uh, post resuscitation care. Uh, once you have effective uh, ventilation uh, and the circulation have been established, transferred to the NICU. Uh, always keep in mind of uh, post resuscitation uh, hypoglycemia. So check blood sugar levels. As far as uh, induced therapeutic hypothermia, um, hasn't really much uh, talk on that. And the cell intent, they said uh, it's recommended for infants more than 36 weeks of gestation. Um, and they're only telling about places that have uh, resource abundant, uh, abundance area to try doing therapeutic hypothermia. 2015, their recommendation was saying that this goes both for resource abundant and resource limited areas. So just try it. Um, <clears throat> Withholding, withholding and discontinu discontinuing care, um, there should be a consistent and coordinated approach to individual cases by obstetric and neonatal teams and the parent. Um, clinicians should not hesitate to withdraw support when functional, survivor is, uh, functional survival is highly unlikely. Um, it is reasonable to stop assisted ventilation if the apical goes zero at 10 minutes of resuscitation with like undetectable heart rate. Um, variables to keep in mind um, is whether um, resuscitation was considered optimal, avail uh, available of advanced needle care, like if you have therapeutic hypothermia or anything else that you could try, and um, family expressed wishes, also very important. Resuscitation is not indicated when gestation, birth weight, or congenital anomalies are associated with early death. Um, variables also keep in mind when you're counseling families about making a prognosis for survival for gestation of less than 25 weeks um, is you want to keep in mind the accuracy of the gestational age assignment, the presence, absence of chorionitis, level of care available, um, decision about the appropriateness of resuscitation less than 25 weeks also could be influenced by the region specific guidelines. And last we'll finish up with uh, my last slide is talking about briefing and debriefing. Um, this article was um, in 2007 in the Journal of Critical Care Medicine, Duke. Um, and what they did is they made checklists, and checklists would have everything in the neonatal resuscitation as far as how the um, chest compressions went or how the intubation went. Um, and, um, and their results um, they took was based on reviewing what the fellow residents' um, evaluations were. Um, so, and they found that it showed that uh, um, to improve their knowledge and their skills, and they really liked the using the checklist. And references, references. I'm not, any questions or comments? That's not a human baby. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> more and more complex cardiac defects are diagnosed in late adults, especially if it's really later. We born at a non tertiary care center, we are aware of the people in the report. We have to ask the families what we can do. Thank you.
Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. More room for the other team. Yeah. Yeah, these these rooms are put in a line. And if you're doing a newborn rotation, please try to go to the all delivery, particularly those being attended by the NICU or the charge nurse, because then you'll get more things on because while you're in the NICU you don't get enough time to see the patients and do the things also. When you are newborn nursery, please try to attend so in that way you don't feel that by the second or third year that you're not thinking to maybe enough or you don't That's true. 